The gospel reading this morning is Matthew 5, verses 1 to 12, commonly called the Beatitudes. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain. And after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Here ends the reading of these words inspired by God. May God grant us wisdom and courage for interpretation. So, if I were a pinball machine, all my lights would be flashing and all my bells would be ringing and across my forehead would be one word, tilt. Because the lectionary readings for today, the fourth Sunday of Epiphany, are just great. I want to go to the lectionary people who put them together and say, couldn't you have spread these out over a few weeks? From Micah 6, 8, he has told you, O mortal, what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. That's it, isn't it? That's the pre-gospel gospel, along with love God, love your neighbor, and love yourself. And it's the result of the gospel because it does come back full circle to the ancient Israelites and their relationship with God and with one another. It was their ideal anyway, and it's ours. From 1 Corinthians 1, 18, for the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And if those awesome passages aren't enough to ring your bells and flash your lights, there's the gospel reading. It's the start of the great sermon in Matthew, the Sermon on the Mount, and we'll be hearing from it for the next several weeks. For most people, it's the very heart of what we have of Jesus' teachings. And it starts with the Beatitudes, words so familiar that most of the world still knows them, not just the church. And I stand here before these words a little intimidated. They're so familiar, I wonder, what can I say? Yet I trust God. Because as the preacher who wrote the epistle to the Hebrews put it in 4.12, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing until it divides soul from spirit, joints from marrow, it is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And so it's in that spirit that I want to do more listening with you today than preaching. I want us to listen in the spirit and faith of our Congregationalist forebear, the English separatist, Pastor John Robinson, and his famous farewell to the pilgrims as they left for this continent on the good ship Mayflower. Robinson said, the Lord hath more light and truth yet to break forth from his holy word. Or as we put it in the United Church of Christ, God is still speaking. So what I want to do is read several versions of these old familiar verses. I may have a word or two as we go, but not many. And then I'll look at a few of them individually, and then I'll close with a few words. But please, first, please join me in another short word of Spirit of truth, open to us the scriptures, speaking your holy word, and meeting us in the living Christ. 
Amen. This is Matthew 5, 1 to 12 from the message. When Jesus saw his ministry drawing huge crowds, he climbed a hillside. Those who, those who were apprenticed to him, the committed, climbed with him. Arriving at a quiet place, he sat down and taught his climbing companions. This is what he said. You're blessed when you're at the end of your rope. With less of you, there is more of God and his rule. You're blessed when you feel you've lost what is most dear to you. Only then can you be embraced by the one who really is most dear to you. You're blessed when you're content with just who you are, no more, no less. That's the moment you find yourselves proud owners of everything that can't be bought. You're blessed when you've worked up a good appetite for God. He's food and drink and the best meal you'll ever eat. You're blessed when you care. At the moment of being careful, you find yourselves cared for. You're blessed when you get your inside world, your mind and heart, put right. Then you can see God in the outside world. You're blessed when you can show people how to cooperate instead of compete or fight. That's when you discover who you really are and your place in God's family. You're blessed when your commitment to God provokes persecution. The persecution drives you even deeper into God's kingdom. Not only that, count yourselves blessed every time people put you down or throw you out or speak lies about you to discredit me. What it means is that the truth is too close for comfort and they are uncomfortable. You can be glad when that happens. Give a cheer even. For though they don't like it, I do. And all heaven applauds. And I know that you're in good company. My prophets and witnesses have always gotten into this kind of trouble. Now from the living Bible. One day as the crowds were gathering, he went up the hillside with his disciples and sat down and taught them there. Humble men are very fortunate, he told them, for the kingdom of heaven is given to them. Those who mourn are fortunate, for they shall be comforted. The meek and lowly are fortunate, for the whole wide world belongs to them. Happy are those who long to be just and good, for they shall be completely satisfied. Happy are the kind and merciful, for they shall be shown mercy. Happy are those whose hearts are pure, for they shall see God. Happy are those who strive for peace, they shall be called the sons of God. Happy are those who are persecuted because they're good, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. And note that happy. Some scholars, some scholars say that's not really the best word. It's not just happy versus sad. It's blessed by God, held close by God. God, it's not just happy. When you are reviled and persecuted and lied about because you are my followers, wonderful. Be happy about it. Be very glad. For a tremendous reward awaits you up in heaven. And remember, the ancient prophets were persecuted too. And from the King James Version, and this will be the most familiar to you, and I think it's interesting that the NRSV, which I read at first, and which is our Pew Bible, sticks so closely to this language. It's because it's so, it's so not just because it's so rich and memorable. The King James Version is not... There, the issues with the King James aren't with the King James. It's that the language that we use has so far gone beyond it. But these words are so close to the text that the King James was translating that it's stuck in our culture, right? Even the world knows these words. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they who do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. Blessed are they who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall revile you and persecute you, and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely 
for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets who were before you. Finally, I want to share a paraphrase of my own. Now, I'm no, I'm no Greek translator, so this is a paraphrase. It's meant, to be, it's meant to be just a little humorous, but serious too. Two pastor friends of mine, one a United Methodist pastor in Illinois, and the other a Disciples of Christ pastor in Colorado, asked if they could use it in their own sermon. So it's got something going for it. Uh, but it's in dialect. It's in my own native dialect as a rural country Oklahoma type person. It's a snippet from a longer project that I started before seminary and that I hope to finish afterwards. It's a country paraphrase of the four Gospels. I hope it makes you smile, and it might even make you laugh a little, but I think you'll get something out of it. Now, in my version, the kingdom of God is, quote, God and his posse. You know, like a sheriff deputizing men to, to help with a special project, because I really do believe that we are deputized by God for the special mission of spreading and living the gospel. So here's Matthew 5, 1 to 12 from what I'm calling the chicken fried gospels with the words of our Lord printed in redneck. I think it'll sell. <laughs> but we'll find out. Once Jesus looked around at everybody, got up on a hill and just sat down like he was fixing to let somebody in on something. Like he knew what he was talking about. The curious and the hangers-on and the ones out to get something for nothing and the crowd in general, they were all within earshot. But his closest pals, the disciples, they climbed up, they had climbed up with him, and they got an earful. And Jesus taught them, saying, When you're down on your luck, you're on a roll, a holy roll, because God and his posse are riding by wanting to help you right here and right now. When you're lonesome and crying your eyes out because somebody died or something of yours got lost, you're on a roll because you're primed for somebody to love on you. When you're reining yourself in and still comfortable in your own skin, you're on a roll because you've got it made. Nothing you could buy could make things any better. When you're hungry as a horse for what God is serving up, speaking all spiritual like now, you're on a roll because you're fixing to get some supper, the likes of which your mama couldn't even fix up. When you're going easy on somebody, you're on a roll, because others are going to take it easy on you. When you get all the weeds hoed out of your insides, when you get your old black heart right and your clabbered head clear, you're on a roll, because then God's spirit can sprout around you, in you, and outside of you. And when you're calming folks down and keeping them from tearing into each other, you're on a roll because before long you'll see you're not the only one and that you've got lots of spiritual kin folks out there trying to do the same. When you're catching hell for the things of heaven, you're on a roll because God and his posse are right there with you. Come to think of it, when folks are just tearing you apart, making up lies about you, running you off from some places and locking you out of others because of me and the way we get along, it's because it's rubbing them the wrong way and making them mean and you're on a roll because you ain't in this rodeo by yourself. Just have a good laugh about it because that's always going to be the case. Maybe that'll help pay my seminary student loan debt. We'll see. <laughs> now, who is Jesus talking about in these old familiar verses? The disciples? Jesus' people in general? The church? I confess that I never thought he was talking about us, the church, necessarily. I saw the verses as ideals, you know, definitely what we should be aiming for. St. Augustine in the 4th century regarded the Beatitudes, in fact, the whole Sermon on the Mount, actually, as revealing the perfect standard of the Christian life. Well, I can go with that, but there's one thing. Perfect standards soon become impossible goals, and before long, they become nice sayings that people love to hear and repeat. They become platitudes, empty of much meaning, and these are not the be platitudes, these are the beatitudes. They can become so empty that even the world still remembers them and quotes them, not just the church. So what if this is it? 
What if Jesus is not necessarily talking about the church, but the ones that God is especially partial to? The poor, the outcasts, the victims of empire and politics and economics and great wars and petty selfishness, the victims of humanity in general, you know, the ones that we as the church are primarily charged with getting the good news to. In other words, those folks are blessed. It's our job to bring them fully into the beloved community, to seek and to save that which is lost, that which is lost but blessed that they haven't yet got the news. They have not been welcomed fully into the beloved community that God and his posse are rounding up and building up, that is, the kingdom of God. So let's say that Jesus is talking about the people at the edges of the crowd around him and the hard edges of life in general. Blessed are they. And who is Jesus talking to? Well, mainly to the disciples, but the crowd is within earshot listening in, but it's not clear really who he's talking to. I think he's teaching all who are listening. And here's where Jesus, yet again, speaking the word of God, messes with the space-time continuum and with people's minds, including the disciples, who are almost always lunkheads, and us, as we still see through that dark glass. See, Matthew has Jesus speaking with authority. Remember? The authority of God that left his family and oldest family friends back in Nazareth amazed with him right up until they decided it was so far-fetched they couldn't take him seriously, and they laughed at him. So he withdrew to Capernaum. Here Jesus is speaking these things into being because some of the words just don't make any sense at face value. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That's so nice. But what? Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Okay, great. When? Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. The meek will inherit the earth. Really. But Matthew has Jesus speaking not only with authority, but, ex but eschatologically, that is, with the end of the age and the start of the new age in sight. Matthew sets that up. The new age is in sight, but not only in sight, but already here. And here's how, here's how the Jesus Seminar puts it, and people either love or hate the Jesus Seminar, but I think they get this one right. I think they get a lot right. But I think they get this really right. Quote, For Jesus, the kingdom of God was not the inauguration of an apocalyptic era within history. The kingdom of God was not the end of history following a cosmic catastrophe. Rather, Jesus spoke most characteristically of God's rule as close or already present but unobserved. This view thwarts ordinary expectations, an approach that seems typical of Jesus' style. Jesus is always zigging when people expect him to zag. He's always thwarting expectations. So yes, let's take a theological editing hand to these verses and see what more light and truth the Lord hath to break forth from God's holy word. Will we get the good news to those who hunger and thirst for righteousness? For they will be filled. They are filled. Will we get the news to the merciful, whoever they are? For they will receive mercy. The, mercy have, the merciful have received mercy. To the pure in heart, wherever they are on life's journey. For they will see God. Will we show them God in Christ now? In the already and not yet kingdom? Will we get the word to the peacemakers, especially to the peacemakers, all, all the peacemakers, for they will be called, for they are the children of God. To the poor in spirit, to those who mourn, to the meek, to those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for those who seek justice and justice for all, whoever they are and wherever they are on life's journey, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. May we seek them and find them and welcome them to the beloved community for their sake and for Christ's sweet sake and for our own sake because I want to close with another glimpse of light and truth and this is a different look at an old familiar verse. Verse 11, Jesus said, and here it's clear, he is speaking to the disciples. Blessed are you 
when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. And I'm sure that most of us think, thank you, Jesus, it is hard sometimes. We imagine some slight or remember some real smirk we got from someone one time. Or we mourn the passing of, quote, the way things used to be in this country when almost everybody went to church and sacrilege and blasphemy wasn't on every channel as it is. And organized, aggressive atheism could not even be fathomed as it exists today. We think, yes, we are reviled. Some of us do feel persecuted. Oh, please. In Syria, yes. In Iraq, yes. Our LGBTQ brothers and sisters do have a rough time of it still, but we stand beside them, and the ranks of other Christians who do are growing. But imagine Jesus on the hilltop, seeing across 2,000 years and that rip he created in the space-time. He squints and he says to the world, not to the church, he says to the world, blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. That's so hard to say. My pastor friend in Colorado, Marnie Lineberger, Lineberger said, when I think of all the maliciousness and name calling done in the name of Christianity, this beatitude takes on a whole new meaning. Yes, it does, sister. Oh God, as we hear this and confess it, may we be poor in spirit. May we mourn. May we be meek. Oh God, may we hunger and thirst for justice. May we have mercy. May we make peace so that we may be blessed. We ask for it in blessed hope. Amen.